Hello and welcome to this uh, second first look exploring session looking at the second half of Antigone, uh, uh, which is uh, a play by Thomas May, uh, which we uh, really enjoyed the first half. Um, uh, it had a lot of a lot of oomph to it and a lot of potential that we, we really enjoyed really enjoyed um and uh we are going to continue from act three scene two um apologies to anyone watching this video immediately after last video um i don't know if you can tell by the length of our our, our hair and or beards it's actually been slightly longer than we intended uh to return to the second half so hopefully we won't have forgotten anything that that is occurring um and that we will all be uh we will all be on point but uh it has been a little while uh it reading variously uh it creon uh de file first male chorus is hi i'm eric i am the voice of darkness for today apparently uh reading ianthus uh dircus a fighters tiresias and theseus is Hi, I'm Greg. I've been working on my nice. I'm back to playing blind people. Reading Second Hag, Carcass, Amon, Antigone, and Nuncius is. Liza Graham in London. Yes. Uh, reading uh, Third Hag, Aja, Third Male Chorus, Men Chorus, Chorus. Lots of choruses is. Hi, it's Tom from Brighton. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading stage directions. I'm also going to be reading uh, various hags, widows, um, uh, Eurydice, um, and things. So it's all going to get a little, a little complicated, and and see where we go with that. Uh, so, without any further ado, we're going to dive into Act Three, Scene Two, the beginning of Act Three. We had an awful lot of people tiptoeing through corpses. Uh, in exciting ways and hopefully we will sustain such action as we go into act three uh, again some of the scene numbering here is is speculative so uh, they they may or may not match which version we may change our minds later uh, but uh, whatever happens everybody else has left the stage and enter creon and ianthus the watch is diligent they do not know that i am in the field no, sure, my lord, for your disguise is perfect, and no notice was given from me at all. What things are these? Two hags pass over the stage. Witches, my lord, that come to exercise on these dead bodies that wish through the field their damned arts. Here in the depth of night, with incantations and abused herbs, they turn the dead's pale faces to inquire and hear the horrid oracles of death. The infernal gods, all mastered by their power, or else persuaded by some piety which pleases them, deny these witches nothing which they request. The souls of those dead men are forced to obey their charmings and return back to their ancient prisons to reveal to these dire hags the secrecies of fate and things to come. I'll follow the mindless and, find and know what fortunes shall attend my reign. Ah, oh, good, my lord, use not so bad a way. You have at hand a nobler means to know the truth of all. The old Tiresias, taught from the wisdom of the gods above, who by a magic more divine and pure surveys the course and influence of the stars, and in that glorious book reads the event of the future things. Rather repair to him. Let him prepare a sacrifice and ask the pleasure of the gods. Tut tut, Ianthus. Astrology is uncertain, and the gods in mystic riddles wrap their answers up. But he that dares with confidence go inquire of death's black oracles below. In plainest terms, the certain truth shall know. Exuant uh, Creon and Ianthus uh, enter or re enter the two hags. We come too late, nor can this field to us a speaking prophet yield. The carcasses whose cold dead tongues from whole and yet unperished lungs twixt hell and us should hold commerce and be the black interpreters of Stygian councils to relate the hid degrees of death and fate. Those 
carcasses, I say, are grown, corrupt and rotten every wone, their marrows lost, their moistures gone, their organs parched by the sown, that there the ghost drawn up from hell's dark entrance naught but broken yells, and dismal hissings can afford not one intelligible word. But... From this field of slaughter, I have gathered up a treasury. As dead men's limbs wet in the rain, cold jellied tongues and parched brain, the slime that on black knuckles lies, shrunk sinews and congealed eyes, bit from their fingernails or groan, and from young chins pulled springing down. Flesh bit by wolves I took away and robbed the vulture of her prey. With Thebans funeral piles had made, I did the morning fire invade, and their black rags with ashes filled and coals on which their fat distilled. <laughs> I gathered up and took from thence half-burnt bones and frankincense, and snatched the fatal kindling brand from out the weeping parent's hand. Once more, let's trot the fields about to find a fresher carcass out, and speak a charm that may affright all pious love from hence to night, lest we by funeral rites do lose what Creon's cruelty bestows. Enter the third hag with a carcass. By Creon's trembling watch I bore this new slain carcass, but before Ooh. I brought him thence and gripped him round, the fillets of his lungs are sound. His vitals all are strong and whole to entertain the wretched soul, whose false furies must affright back from hell to us tonight. Enter Creon and Aeanthus. You wise interpreters of fate that look with just contempt down on that small allowance of knowledge, which weak human breasts possess, whose subtle eyes can penetrate the depth of dark or avernous secrets, and from thence enforce an answer from the vain finds. Let me from your deep skill be guided now to know the assurance of my future state. It is a king that craves your aid. A king whose power has given your arts furtherance. By my command, these carcasses have lying unburied here for you to practice on. If Creon then deserve it at your hands, resolve me of my fate. You have your wish. This carcass shall relate it. Do not fear. To hear him speak, what herbs have you prepared? I here have gathered all in one the poisonous jelly of the moon, mixed with sulphur of the night, libid's bane and aconite, dew gathered ere the morn arose, from nightshade, henbane, cypress boughs, amongst living creatures I have sought, and from each baneful brood have brought there what air could aid to our work give skins stripped from horned snakes alive the lynx's bowels blood of frogs the screech owl's eggs the foam of dogs the wings of bats with dragon's eyes the crow's black head the stone that lies in eagles nests and pebbles round that when the ocean ebbs are found Enough, but I had to add these to so known than vulgar helps of our great art have gone, and found such simples who concealed aid no which e'er used, or trembling God obeyed. The Estlers valleys, Colcock's famed shores, nor Libyan's squalid sands with gorgont gore. Be weep, be dewed, and sprinkled ne'er produce juice that could so much ethereal the deities when I first when first I plucked them in yon gloomy vale, the furies shrieked, and he cat grew pale, as loath to have in what abhorred ground the power of simples and their weakness found. 
Then let us now employ their powerful help. What place do we design for our black work? There is within Kithiron's hollow side a dark and squalid cave where night ne'er peeped, nor ever light but light by match. Magic made shot through that dismal air, pale, mouldy filth, bred there by dreary night, or spreads the place, the mouth of Tenerus, that baleful bound twixt heaven and hell, appears not half so black to this sad cave. The accustomed fiends ascend and think themselves still in their proper place. But ghosts that newly passed Avernus Lake shun the ascent, and though by us invoked, tremble to enter to that place unknown, and find a hell more horrid than their own. Then thither let us bear this carcass hence. No, no, we scorn the helps of that dark place, nor is it honour to our arts to find, but make a darkness fit to serve our ends. We that can force a magic light to glide through closest vaults can force in spite of day a mist of night to rise, which all the rays of burning Phoebus shall want power to scatter. Oh, would it were not night, but that the sun rode in his height of strength, how proudly then might we perform our rites and make it known we use not nature's darkness, but our own. Let's go no further then, this place shall serve. Apply your ointments to the body whilst I prepare and speak a charm shall quickly call the affrighted soul back to his mansion. My joints begin to tremble, and I fear as much as the means of knowledge as the event of what I came to know. What a black and baleful horror is this art of theirs. What I were well from hence, for me hereafter, rather remain in endless ignorance than purchase knowledge by such means as these. Sad king of night, whose baleful monarchy the still repaired ruins of mankind through every age increase that grievest alone to see the heavenly gods forever free from death's assaults and thy subjection, old formless chaos, thou that would deface nature's whole beauty, quite disjointed her fabric and swallow up in dark confusion 10,000 worlds, thou squalid ferryman of still Avernus, thou three-headed porter, you snake-herd sisters, publishers of guilt, as you would gain our aid or fear our threats, whip back again into this upper world, that new-fled soul, which did of late inhabit this pale and ghastly seat. But if in vain on you I call, thou wretched wandering ghost, not transported o'er and burning streams, but doomed to exile for a hundred years, if true rewards can tempt thee, once again enter thy ancient prison, and in lieu of that sure penance, I will make thee free, releasing all thy tedious banishments, of fair Elysium, with such powerful rites, I'll give thee burial, as no magic spells nor incantations shall forever call thee back. Nor trouble thine eternal rest. Relate to Creon, king of Thebes, the fate that shall attend his reign. The carcass stirs. Face retains pale death, yet it seems to live. The carcass speaks. Thy death is near, yet ere thou die, a great and strange calamity shall seize thy house, and thou in woe shall think the fatal sisters slow in giving death 
Desiring then thy reign's short date had shorter been, yet thou in at last in death shalt have, though thou denied'st it us, a grave. The carcass falls. Shame on your damned arts! It does not lie within the power of fate to work this mischief. Leave it not, my lord. Let's quit the place, and from the wise Tiresias speak, seek advice. And they exit. It isn't really the end of a scene. I, th I think uh, Act 3 seems to be flowing scene into scene into scene. Um, but I think it's definitely a unit of action uh, as we're about to go into the next bit. But I think we should just, 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 just go for the extraness of that. That was so much fun. Um, I mean, it was so over the top. Um, it's just this whole other universe that is going on in this play um and it, it fits entirely with where we left off in the last session with them all creeping through the bodies and 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 uh i think was it dirkus uh, uh, or uh, or uh, Eamon were just freaking themselves out over just how horrible this this vista is and then it's not only the bodies it's the people body snatching and doing horrible evil magic uh, uh with the king's approval i mean that is the thing this tacit agreement from the king to do this stuff i mean this is this is delightfully messed up i'm 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 fascinated by this whole uh, uh additional unit unit to the thing uh to this world this this play just 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 keeps on giving in a way that i say the previous play we read by the same author um really didn't uh this is this is this is doing things i like uh thoughts on the room uh greg it's interesting because the, the, the hags are very much the centre of that scene, but actually Creon and um, I'm just going to say the hell I was playing then. The answers are quite an interesting side um, uh, part of it, but I, I find it very interesting that, of course, the corpse carcass, whatever you want to call it, of um, la la la, where the brother, whichever brother it is, is now just escape me, but. Corpses are so key to Antigone, you know, that the whole plot revolves around a corpse, almost, you know, it, 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 is that this, to then have this scene where uh, anonymous corpses suddenly become the focus of the scene, mm -hmm. and then suddenly this incredible sort of carcass coming, speech that, you know, foretelling the fate, I just, it, it's a really interesting taking that plot the elements of Antigone further and creating this incredibly brilliant scene. I, sorry, just rambling Greg there. <laughs> well, and yeah, and because we're talking about the very beginning of the act, you know, the, 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 the stage is littered with bodies. Well, one of those bodies definitely is a human being. <laughs> they get up and i love this you know the stage direction carcass falls if if the actor does that right you know that's a real just, just the the strings are cut and it just snaps down like a, a lifeless puppet this, this is a re visually a really interesting act in a way that the first two are, are, were were much less so the, this one you know as a, as a theater maker i'm just sort of going yeah there's stuff we can do here and have so much fun with uh tom and eric were waving um, I, lo I loved the hags were, because they weren't overcooked and they weren't undercooked either. They were they were proper power mongers. Um, mm. They yeah. know their business. They're getting on with it. Um, I mean, you say <laughs> they're not overcooked. I was overcooking it. Um, <laughs> I could have taken that a lot further. I'm kind of glad they didn't. Uh, Eric. Uh, no, I, I was going to say that, like, I, I like how the, the one of the, I think it was the third hag as well, who sort of went, um, yeah, I wish it were daylight's damage so we could show off. We're so powerful. Let me show you what we can do. Uh, yeah. the, so it's kind of, I don't know, they're probably going, um, they almost cabaret hags, but not quite. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, uh, that, that scene was obviously not funny. But um, it's just such a good scene. And there's a part of me going, is the carcass the same person that... Because, um, like, obviously the brother uh, all been nice. He's, I can't remember which of the two. I keep confusing. I mean, it's... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Basically, like, there's a part of me going, the person... Because they carried him off at the end of the previous scene. Yeah, it will have to be a different... It'll have to be a different course. But the question of whose body it is is is, is not, yeah. a, not... You know, who was that guy? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Um, you know... Uh, who, who were they? 
also with the king's approval is probably going okay this is very dark i mean like i, I like mm. how they justify the, the hag's existence in this play by sort of going well you you left them unburied for us basically mm, yes um, there's an alternative reason for creon doing this and you know maybe yeah. maybe there's some deal he's done in the past you know to get himself power all sorts of fun things could be had out of that um but mm. we won't go there for the moment. Uh, any other thoughts? Otherwise, we will continue the act. I say it's, it's all basically continuous action. Uh, but we've labelled this as Act 3, Scene 3. Enter Eamon and Dirkus. Dirkus, she's gone, and I am worse than dead. Oh, would the villain's arms had had the power to have dispatched me quickly. But my lord, take fairer hopes and live. Cast not away thy kingdom's joys. What cruelty can touch a sweet of virtue as Antigone? Retire with me into your little house. I'll dare bind up your wounds. You bleed too fast. Needs must faint before you reach the walls. The wounds I took are scratches. Honest, Dirkus, what care can e'er my body have without the presence of my soul? Delay not, sir. Thy, thy goodness will protect them. What other lady was that with her? It seems it was... Argia, dead Polynices' wife, Adrastus' daughter, or else some grace or goddess in that shape came to consort with good Antigone. Wandering about the fields to find out you, I met with witches, impious hags that came, as I suppose, for execrable ends, there to abuse the bodies of the dead. Oh, partial fates, oh, to endure this night, could these escape when piety must suffer? The faintness seizes me. I prithee, Dirkus. Let me have speedy news. You shall, my lord. When I have dressed you out of court and then to bring you a true and swift intelligence. They exit and we go into the chorus for Act 3. Uh, enter a chorus of widows and defile. By what new ways of grief shall we our widowed losses signify? What strange expression can become a woe so strangely burthensome? No howls, no shrieks, no voice of woe. Not such as widowed turtles show. Nor such as Philomel, when she, high seated on a poplar tree, sends sad notes through the air of night, wailing the husbandman's despite that reaved her of her dearest nest. Our loss cannot be so expressed. No, nor by actions such as are the rending of dishevelled hair or beating of our breasts, these all, no more than death and funeral, can show. But in our husbands we receive a greater injury than death had done. The common right of funeral barred in despite. Cease widows longer in that strain to wail, or against the fates complain for funeral rites. But understand, great Theseus, whose victorious hand in conquests never yet has failed is he, whom, with whom we have prevailed for aid. And think what action he undertakes, already done. He will revenge on Creon's head, uh, the wrongs that we have suffered. Our dear Lord's ghosts shall right it be. Then join your voices all with me, and in triumph so triumphant songs let us renown the noble Theseus. Theseus is he whose warlike hand defends mankind in every land, no less by tyrants feared and known than was the fair Alcmena's son. T'was he whose just revenging steel subdued and made dire sinness feel the selfsame torture in his death by which he took up from others' breath when trees together bowed were and parted thence did tear. Poor wretches, but by Theseus he was forced to taste that tragedy progress is that inhuman thief monster nature past belief that made all passengers who he surprised them in the woods to beat by an unheard of cruel sport stretched longer out or else cut short to fit their stature to his bed by theseus hand was conquered and doomed then himself to die by the same kind of cruelty was he alone that did set free Athens from that sad slavery which Minos fury for the loss of his beloved Androgeus had brought them to, when with clue he scaped the labyrinth and slew fierce Minotaurus that had been the monstrous issue of the Queen Persephone, whom unnatural prodigious lust had made to fall before a bull the monster held both shapes and her foul guilt revealed. 
against the far worse monster now, the noble Theseus arms to go. In humane Creon that denies the worthiest souls due obsequies and what those monsters would not do does after his uh, does after death his hate pursue. Oh, let that still victorious sword be now as prosperous and afford to wicked Creon the just meed that is deserved for such a deed. But tis against all holy laws to doubt success in such a cause. End of Act Three. Um. Okay, so yeah, so we sort of power on after after the uh, the previous scene. We're sort of doing some reported plot stuff, following on from stuff we did at the end of the previous session, uh, and and but we then conclude with a chorus. Uh, we weren't so impressed with some of the earlier choruses. How are we finding this, Liza? I saw you waiting. Oh, yes. I mean the um the cor. I like this chorus because it does what choruses. I think the best thing choruses are for, which is to draw attention to the moral dimension of the plot, that it's it's there to say this is injustice and Creon is comparable to these cruel people from the past and let's, you know, uh, and let's hope that he meets a similar end. It's a bit like the bit on a news show where you, you go from breaking news to some expert analysis and, and that's kind of what this is, uh, or on the ground reactions rather from the widows. Um, what I found intriguing, uh, speaking of breaking news, was that the scene we've all basically been waiting for um, is the scene where Antigone and in this play Argya are discovered uh, are discovered uh, burying the dead and arrested. Like we were all waiting for that confrontation, and instead we get the scene with the hags. And then the arrest gets reported. So like, presumably Creon, just like on his way back from the Hag conference, um, just happened to apprehend Antigone. And, and you, I, I, it's, it's strange. It's strange. Do we, but do we ever have that scene? Um, I, I don't think Sophocles gives us that scene. Um, uh... No, he he doesn't. But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that early modern drama does put on stage that classical mm. drama doesn't. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, in a sense, this is sort of semi-classical in the sense that each act is very much a a single location. Um, uh, and, and so, but this is the location where it's happening. So they could quite easily have maybe found a way. But um, yeah, it 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 is doing interesting things there, uh, Eric. Um, just like being uh the sort of party pooper that it is the next scene kind of but it's not it's not the moment of confrontation but it's sort of the moment of arrest kind of like the, the, basically someone else is dragged them in uh as far as i can tell uh just reading the top of the next scene which mm. is an interesting place to put a, a break i mean considering like you want to know if this is going to happen or not you want to know if, i mean obviously if you know the story of antigone then it's like yeah but um, <laughs> you, you kind of like expect that um, to happen, and yes, I, I, I don't see actually. I was just looking through this. Where, um, uh, how, how is that actually that information related? I, I, I don't recall them being arrested actually. Um, he's talking about that they were out and about, but I don't recall seeing a line saying they were arrested. Um. Amon Amon refers to it, but Creon doesn't. Does he? Yes, and at the top of the yeah. scene, Dirkus, she's gone, uh, and uh, they don't even directly say that she's been arrested. But that scene is a reaction. Presumably, Amon was there and tried to defend her and got wounded. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like the scene we're missing might be it might have been done in dumb show, hmm. or um. Or, I don't know, perhaps the writer simply expects the audience or or reader to know. Yeah, it it it, it cuz that that I I completely skipped me by you see cuz I I I hadn't really taken that in as as that. Uh okay, let's move let's 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 read on and and see what Act 4 gives us and and see if we can fill in some of the gaps there. Well, Eric, Eric. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Eric. I, I was just going to say that if I remember correctly, it was in the previous part that we did where I mean like sort of before we 
in the previous video, basically. Um, uh, so it, was, it was something um, at the end of uh, scene, uh, scene, because, scene one uh, of the act, was it? Amon had gone out to find her, and he saw people like with torches and like the watch and stuff. So it was kind of, and they and they had run from the watch as well, trying to carry the body and return and stuff before. So it was basically a ticking clock kind of thing in the background. Um, yeah, so so in the sense, yeah, there there is that sort of a setup that the watch is out and they're going to get her, and he runs off to do something. So so yeah, in in a sense that even though the scene isn't there, it is it is a it is a present absence, rather than random. And this is where not doing this video immediately after the previous one, <laughs> it's, it's, we have failed. I apologise, uh, viewers and listeners, um, for 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 uh, for the the break in the service. Slightly bamboozling us there. Okay, good. Let us move on to Act Four then, and find out what goes on there. There's quite a few people on stage. Hopefully, nobody talks at the same time. But I think some people are vaguely on and then don't say a lot. Uh, so, enter Ephitus, Creon, Dercus, Antigone, and Argia. And Polynices's body is interred by these two ladies. Then my apprehension, just as the day deed was done. Well, fact one i suspect still and i am glad i have her what's the other the woeful widow of that wronged prince who stayed behind my countrymen to do those rights which love and piety required to my dear lord if that be judged a crime tis such a crime i profess and boast are you a drastic daughter, then? The same. You are our prisoner now. Take her, Yanthus, into your custody. This falls out fitly. The ransom of this princess will come well to fill our now exhausted treasury. But thou, a Theban born to you, bound to obey our crown and laws, what fury moved thy breast, disloyal nation, to scorn our edicts so? No other fury than the love of virtue and reverence of the gods moved me to this, which were it to do again, not all the power of hell and tyrants should affright me from it. Has guilt emboldened thee? Is this the excuse thou makest to me? Creon, let impious acts seek for excuses. I nor can nor will so wrong the cause of heaven and piety as once to plead a fond excuse for that which is my merit. For that act I say, which by direction from the gods themselves I have performed. Is disobedience merit? Or do the gods command subjects to break the laws of princes? Yes, their wicked laws, which thwart the will of heaven, the rule of nature, and those pure principles which human breasts did that their first original derive from that celestial essence, such a law was this, which I have broke, in giving rites of funeral to Polynices, hearse, my dearest brother. This disobedience thy servants, durst they speak, would justify. But foreign nations and all future times, in spite of tyrants' threatenings, shall commend what I have done. Though I die for this unjustly now, yet the infernal judges whose sentence no mortality can scape, but must to all eternity sustain, shall from their just impartial urns bestow endless rewards beyond my sufferings far. To those infernal judges shalt thou go, and thank my charitable doom that sends thy soul to such great happiness. If thou esteem it happiness, and do not fear what thou wouldst seem to wish. No, tyrant, no. Death cannot prove a punishment to me whose life was naught but sorrow. Freed from this unhappy world, in t'other shall I come, most wished and welcome to my father's sight, and that dear brother for whose sake I die. Thou shalt be banished from the light of day, nor then shalt thou immediately have power to see that other world thou so desires. I am thus, till our father, farther pleasure is known, Card save our guide, our dear person. If it is see present execution done upon Antigone, without the city walls, there is a new digged tomb, where never yet lay any funeral. In that 
enclose Antigone alive and bar it fast as thou intendst to live. There let her pray to those infernal gods she so adores to keep her there or take her quickly thence. And exit Creon. Oh, black accursed doom. Oh, my sad fate that must report this news to the noble Haman and with that breath destroy the best of men. Exit Dircus. Furies have left their dark abode to dwell in human shapes on earth. They could not else live such a monster. One so opposed to heaven and goodness as cursed Creon is. Ah, dearest, dearest sister, did the fates defer so long our wished acquaintance here to make us meet so wretchedly at last? Weep not, dear sister. Your calamity adds to my sufferings more. Why were not all the miseries of Cadmus' woeful house confined within ourselves and bounded here in fatal Thebes? Why spread they so to make the best of souls partaker? Happy else and safe forever had your virtue lived, admired in wealthy Argos, had you ne'er, ne'er known the sad affinity of Thebes. Why did the tyrant thus divide our sufferings? The tomb, where thou art closed, had been to me more pleasing than the palace. Heaven forfend! May the just gods hereafter recompense Argaea's virtue with a happier love than Polynices was, and happier friends than Thebes can give. Do not lament for me, not fear the torments of my lingering death. I am provided of a remedy that shall delude the cruelty of Creon. Farewell, my dearest Amon, whose loved presence more than the sight of day afflicts my soul to lose so soon. Farewell, where'er thou art, till in the other world we meet again. And they exuant. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so in terms of the flow of the action, even though, yeah, we don't see that that uh, that arrest, we do get the immediate aftermath of that. We're very much following, um, in terms of the central plot, the 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 narrative as we know it. Um, uh, we're continuing that sort of interesting character uh, choices and people who are involved in this. So we're just com people are commenting in the chat that you know Antigone's sister isn't in this play, um, but we have a sort of sister substitute instead, and 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 so serving a similar function but in a, in a in a different key and doing slightly different things and so there's there's a, there's a really interesting uh, uh sort of way that 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 character substitute even though i say that they essentially do a similar job but they're a different branch of of of, of the family order of things uh so yeah it's 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 interesting how we have a sort of more of an extended um people colluding with antigone as well in the way that uh is meaning doesn't so much as many sort of stands around saying you really shouldn't do it um Korean will get mad uh <laughs> have, have you have you considered not bearing um oh all right i'll help no oh, oh okay okay all right you do it yourself then um i may be simplifying sophocles classic um okay <laughs> uh and yeah thoughts on this uh on antigone on this see it, it, it again this play is very efficient uh generally it it, it it gives us most of the major notes uh gives us something to play but it doesn't linger on anything for very long uh and i maybe this scene is one where i'm going well maybe we could have had a little bit more um but there's some good stuff in there uh any thoughts in the room Hope I turned on original sound. Otherwise, no, no one would have heard of that sound effect. No, I, uh, I, I heard the sound effect. It's um, yeah. Um, I wonder. Let's see. Antigone is supposed to be entombed alive. I don't know if that's in the source material or if it's unique to this play. Um, uh, it it definitely not... turns up in others. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, 
and Eamon got badly hurt trying to keep her from being arrested. Um, and Dirkus is on his way to Eamon with the news, but Antigone implies that she has a means to kill herself uh, in order to prevent Creon making her suffer. Mm. So, who knows? I, I did like the farewell between Antigone and Argya. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 those relationships are working really well, and that is following on from the, the relationships that were b between the various women in, 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 earlier in the play. It's, it, it is doing some nice, ni nice work there. Um, there's always there's always a little bit of a worry, you know, that the the, the Antigone Eamon, um, you know, love plot stuff uh, falls a bit flat. But I, I think on the whole they're doing reasonably well here. Um, uh, I, 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 other opinions may have, be available. Um, okay, let's let's complete Act Four. These are not long acts. These are not. It's not a long play. It really isn't. Um, Act four, scene two. Uh, so you don't have to really break these into scenes uh, necessarily. Enter Eamon. Uh, just, it, 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 just for a, a note for everyone at home, of course, I have doubled the love, the 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 the, the, the love interest. So it's, it's the, the, there may be some issues with the doubling later on. Uh, <laughs> it's just me, myself, and I. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Act 4, Scene 2, Enter Eamon. No news of comfort or discomfort yet. Forgive me, faithful Dirkus, if my soul, my love-sick soul, unjustly do accuse thy diligent care and think thee slack. My heart, till thy return, is stretched upon the rack, a rack of torturing thoughts more painful far than tyranny could wish or foes invent to punish foes. Dost thou delay because the news thou bringst is ill? If my fair love be dead or doomed to death, why dost thou keep my soul from her celestial company? All be well, but O oh, presumptuous soul, check that too happy thought again. I know my father's nature is unmovable in all resolves. And this, bound by an oath so deep, so solemn and inviolable as ere it be broke, will break this heart of mine. See, enter Dirkus. See, here he comes. Speak, man, what news? I, me, thy very looks have blasted me before thy tongue can be their sad interpreter. No news but black could force a soldier's tears. Antigone is dead. Not dead, my lord, but lives among the dead. How, man, expound this enigmatic sorrow? In a tomb where no more shall never more shall sh yeah. <clears throat> sorry. In a tomb where never more she shall behold the day, nor Phoebus's splendor. But the king's command is fair Antigone enclosed alive, to have famished there and die. Enough, enough. Shut up alive to starve, O oh, horrid doom, as if that death alone, though ne'er so gentle, had not been punishment enough for her for such a cause as that. But yet this sentence gives respite to her death and leaves a way to our prevention. I must spend no time in thinking now. All action is required. Thus it must be. Be speedy, faithful friend. Run to my mother, and with all the vows and vehement protestations that thou canst from me, assure her, if Antigone be not released in time, it shall not lie in all the power of earth to save my life. Her love I fear not, though my father now hath cast his frown upon me. To this place return again with all thy speed, whilst I devise some other means if that, that should fail. Be not my care, my lord, but let me crave by your own worth, I beg it, and that favour which you were ever pleased to reflect on my poor services. Till I return, attempt no other course, I will be speedy, and if persuasions of the queen do fail, we'll find a way to save the princess's life but is a desperate way and must be used the last of all. Oh, comfortable Dirkus, do but assure me that, and I shall owe more than my life and all my fortunes to thee. Upon mine honour, I'll not stir from hence till thou return, nor stay, till, nor stay thee now to inquire more of the plot. I will outfly the wind. Exit Dirkus. Closed up alive within a tomb to starve. Oh, horrid cruelty! I would, I could, forget whose crime it were that my free hate might not be checked by duty to a father. 
Should I approve his action for a sin so great against virtue as no time could pardon? Should I condemn it, I must then abhor the offender, and that piety forbids. Why should piety and virtue strive? That piety which I so much admired in fair Antigone myself transgress in loving her cross to my father's will. Yet in obeying him, I must approve her piety or else condemn mine own. What thoughts will reign in this divided breast till Dirkus do return? But courage, heart, more strong is he that can his doubts defer that he that, than he that known calamities doth bear. And exit Eamon. Act four, uh, I'm calling it scene three, but it's the chorus scene, and we have a, a chorus of old men. O oh, smooth thy frown at last, great queen of heaven, let not unhappy Thebes forever feel the, the dire effect of thy too mindful wrath. But could the wretched Semele's offence or poor Alcmena's error more deserve than they themselves have suffered from thy hand? Or if succeeding branches needs must bleed for parents false before a yeah. Before a goddess wrath to be appeased, could not Actaeon's wounds atham th yeah atham athamus madness Eno's woeful death, nor pitied Oedipus is false suffice. Could not the actions of great Hercules, nor Bacchus' glorious deeds, which all mankind forever shall renown, weigh down the crimes of their unhappy mothers, and such crimes as only Jove's resistless power could force? A fiercer war by far now threatens Thebes than that which old Ard Artus, with the aid of it, all his rash confederates could make. The mighty Theseus, whose all-conquering hand no kingdom yet with, satis with safety could withstand, armed with a cause in which the prayers and wish of joint nations joined is marching towards us in vain alas that we expect an end of this dire war when both the princes died when the Argives fled must our own victory become our grief and draw upon us now greater ruin than our foil had done it must, it must, since Creon's cruelty, most unexpected barbarous cruelty, will have it so. O oh, friend, I would believe, were not the noble Aemon Creon's son, and heir apparent to our diadem, we had been happier far to have been subdued than brought by victory to such obedience. True friend, there all our trust in God is naught, but that brave princess life have left us hope of any future favour to redress the miseries which so long have felt. But for this inter imminent, nay, present danger, what were we best to do? Advise the king rather to change his purpose than expose his weakened kingdom to great Theseus' fury, though he should prove never so obstinate, that better than better that any one for good advice should suffer than his fury from his fury than the land in general should smart you counsel well but who should be the man there's none so fit as old tyresia that most holy man taught from the gods above whose words by all our theban princess Princes have been long esteemed as oracles. Him Creon, Creon will obey. Then do they let us and with him advise how to redress our present miseries. And they exit. Okay, this is an interesting spin because we've we've had a mention of Tiresias already, um, a renowned uh, prophet and truth teller. And it's interesting here that the chorus is sort of going... Okay, every, we're all agreed that Creon's gone a bit far. Um, yes, we are. Do we want to tell him? No. Um, <laughs> shall we ask Tiresias to do it? <laughs> and it's sort of like, it, it's it sort of shifts the oracle nature of Tiresias to more, um, he's the only guy in the room who's going to step forward and actually tell truth to power. And it, I, that's not to say Tyrese's isn't still within this universe of uh, uh, a seer and, and, and powerful in that way. But it's interesting that there's this all 
additional political world that's going on in this play. I mean, the same way the hags are embroiled in the politics of the kingdom. It's not even that they're they're separate or they're, 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 they are embedded in a really interesting way. I, I quite like this chorus because it's 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 much more conversational. It's more there are three chaps come on and have a chat um and that that i find quite interesting um uh as well as of course um uh, Eamon, uh, uh, uh how man expand this enigmatic sorrow um occasionally there are there are lines that are less easy to say than others um but <laughs> it is not a perfect text but it, it's got style it's got style this thing uh thoughts in the room how we on Eamon and dirkus uh were we buying them um uh, tom then eric yeah, I like uh, as you say, there's there's a a a, a definite hierarchy, um, and then so everybody's impotent except for Creon, uh, but they're still they still have their opinions. They have their they have their parliaments, if you like. They have the um, their offices to, but um, yeah, n nobody's going going against. Uh, that set hierarchy so there's the there's a potency and and the rest are sort of like squirming under the under the weight mm. uh, eric i was gonna say that it's it's interesting how basically every character has something to lose <laughs> um they like they kind of their choices are not always uh moral or political or whatever but like sort of it, it is well we also have to remember that this is in public um Leon has a lot to lose by messing up the way his image is sort of conveyed and interpreted um aside from everything else uh and also it's like he can't he can't just like be busy with like killing people in the city when like we're gonna be attacked um which is an interesting thing to consider also. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I like the way that Amon is, or him or whatever you want to call it, is framed um, mm. like as a sort of, like, I want to be a dutiful son, but I also don't want the love of my life to die. <laughs> it, it, like, it's kind of, yeah, um, an impossible choice for him and just the way that like for Antigone the impossible choice is sort of resolved by her greater need to bury her brother basically mm. and yeah again we have this the, the, this external political world which I think does it does actually come in in Sophocles or certainly other versions that uh, Theseus is sort of the external um additional factor certainly that the city is still still under some there is still an exterior threat as well um but but with an additional power um so you know creon there there, there is another another uh you know there are, there are additional consequences to what creon is doing here the battle is not over yet in a in a, in a sense um and it has wider repercussions so um I am forgetting precisely in which versions and precisely where that element comes together. Um, uh, Eric? Well, I guess also sort of if you want to look at it like without the details of, you know, this is um, Argos versus Thebes and all that stuff and so on and so forth, you could say that this is like the consequences of civil war. Mm. Um, where, you know, we've seen civil wars in various plays <laughs> before. And it kind of doesn't end well in any situation. Just sort of, I mean, aside from obviously war is a thing. Civil war is going to destroy the sort of stability of the nation anyway. If mm. you if you can't maintain um, power and conf like unify the people under your banner. Mm. Yes, and and Thebes as a city is is sort of doomed as as well. I mean, it's, it's, it is it is it is it is a city with a shelf life, uh, within its within its narrative. So it, it won't it won't you know survive forever. Um, so you know there the, there is an eventual you know end game which isn't good for it. Uh, uh, anyway, we will move into Act Five and find out what's going on there. So Act Five, Scene One. Enter Eurydice and Dircus, and I'm Eurydice. That was my fear before. I fought my son too far in love to bear with patience his lady's death. 
and therefore did entreat the king with tears and sighs that would have moved a rock of flint, but he more hard than rocks, deafer than northern winds, with rage repulsed my oft-repeated suit, and now, my me, what most I feared is proved my son will die, for he has vowed never to pardon her. Must I return the prince this killing news? No, gentle Dirkus. Stay a little while, twill not be long before the king return. I'll move him once again. Your kindness is pardon, not for the world would I delay the time upon uncertainties. I fear I have already stayed too long. My quick return is the only means to keep the prince alive. Please it, your highness, then when I am gone to move the king, and fear not, gracious madam, the prince's life a while, however. Exit, Dirkus. Farewell, that true faithful Dirkus. All the gods assist thy good intents and bless thy loyalty. Enter Creon. What, weeping still? How could I weep myself like Niobe? Would I could weep myself like Niobe to marble and become a woeful tomb to Amon, whom my womb with fate's disastrous wrought, brought into the world, my virtuous Amon. Why is Amon dead? Why do you ask that mean to murder him? How murder him? Yes, in Antigone, his most inseparable love. Must then Bodacious Jiglet uh, live unpunished to brave a king? Were kings ordained to kill virtue's true servants and control her laws? At which point enter Tiresias and uh, the chorus of, all, of men. Where is the king? He's here. What mischief now comes to uh, Never from thy tongue flowed any good to me. Guilty man was never pleased with truth. But hear me, Creon, I come the, to thee, sent from the wrath of gods, to let thee know thy guilt and punishment. Great plagues from heaven, if Tiresias truly divine, are threatened against thy house. When I, for thee, Unthankful man prepared a sacrifice within. The opened beast no signs but sad and fatal did afford. None but the infernal gods deigned to appear. The blood was black. The burning entrails gave no flame at all, but darkly did consume mouldering away to ashes, and with black and savoury smoke clouded the fearful air. Unto our augury, no birds at all, but sad and baleful birds of night appeared. Nor to our orisons would the invoked gods vouchsafe an answer, but in signs alone declared their wrath. The cause of these, their threats against thy house is for thy cruelty to good Antigone. And if she die, these plagues will surely fall. Can we avoid them by sparing her? Hmm. The gods above relent at human penance and hear their prayers. Nor like the fiends they are, are they inexorable? No longer, Creon, shalt thou now deny me, since heaven is joined with my petition. You are not constant in persisting thus, but obstinate. Now I renew my suit. In which we bend our knees. Release, O king, for Thebes, for Amon's sake, that virtuous maid, and to prevent a fierce and cruel war vouchsafe to grant our suit. Give us leave to bury those dead Grecians in the field. No more of them. That last must not be granted, for our command is passed too far already and must be justified, not changed now. 
uh, but for the life of that antigone though it cannot suit well with our justice to pardon her rebellious stubbornness yet she is thine eurydice to thee do we refer her wholly take this ring and to abs an absolute power to dispose of her either to pa pardon or to punishment the gods reward thee for it i'll go myself and bring her out with speed from that sad place heaven grant that grief have not already killed her Exuant everyone except for Creon, enter Nuncius to Creon. To arms, my lord, if any arms so soon can rescue Thebes from quick destruction. The mighty Theseus threatens you at hand. Why, let him come. Should I esteem the name of Theseus such a bugbear it should frighten me from my constant resolution? Have our late conquests, have the over overthrows of Argos and Mycenae taught the world nothing of us. Look on yon purple fields with slaughter dyed and learn what Thebes can do. Where Capaneus and to stout Tydeus, Parthenopeus and uh, Hippomedon lie weltering in their gores. And should we then so tremble at the threats of Theseus? No power must daunt me. It is not kingly now upon constraint to change my rough decree. Though I relented now, though my soft breast were moved with piety, yet thought of honor would conquer that, as it now conquers fear, the fear of Theseus' hand, nor have I left the place for wisdom now. It comes too late. I must prevent or lead my innocent fate. And we pause there at a point where we're not quite sure who's entering and exiting and whether it's a different scene or not that comes next. Um, but a lot's going on there. Um, Eurydice comes on and has a chat telling her husband, maybe you like to not do the thing. Um, I don't think in the Sophocles, actually, Eurydice speaks. Um, I think that they are a dumb uh, figure who crosses the stage at some point um, and is, is related to it and, and maybe has a different name, I forget. Um, but uh, here is, is, is actually a character um, who actually, you know, does something. Um, and then, as promised at the end of the previous act, Tiresias is pushed on by the chorus. So go, go on, t tell the king, tell the king. And, and there's part of me now, the way this is introduced to us, it's almost like Tiresias is going... Did he actually bother even doing the cutting up of the of, of the sacrificial animal, you know, or is he just going through the motions? Yeah, no, it was, the augury was awful, mate. You wouldn't, it, you, you know, because it, it now makes it feel like Tiresias, you know, hasn't gone through, you know, he's going through the motions. I mean, all of the stuff about the blood was black and burning entrails and all that stuff, that's very much out of uh, out of Sophocles and, and other uh, texts. I mean, I, I, I suspect some of that's almost verbatim translation in places. Um, it's very familiar, all of that. Um, but then it might not even be Tiresias. Any any random prophet and or uh, augury uh, speech will f do the same. Um, but was, yeah, quite quite liking that. I like the way Creon sort of tries to save a little face there and, you know, be turned and, you know, it's... it's um, and then, of course, he's told about um, Theseus and he's he's back to being, yeah, uh, I can take him. It's fine. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. He's probably quite worried. It's not going. It's not a good. Day. It's not been a good week. I mean, to be fair, he's he's he's, he's gone through a lot. Um, thoughts on Creon and or anyone else. Um, I was disappointed. The Nuncius, I, I was hoping was going to have a long speech, but they got three lines. Um, uh, Tom, then Liza. I just, I, I just like the, the pace, if you like, or the lack of pace of, of sieges and battles, and you know they see they, you would get this intense um, slaughter, and then days would pass, and eons would sort of like. People would go about their, their business and go back home and come back again. And and it's it's that it's that pacing of but still with the tension in the background of, of, of sort of like long drawn out inevitability of fates and maybe that's why they were so superstitious. Mm -hmm. Uh Liza. Well, I'm a little basically. Um, but, okay, so Antigone 
at the end of the condemnation scene, Antigone hinted that she had some of her means to cause her own death, which basically means that everything else, um, everything else has to move at the speed of plot. Um, at the speed of plot is a phrase that I picked up from a uh, TV writer and comics writer, J. Michael Straczynski. Uh, someone asked him in one of his uh, stories, someone asked him, well, how far does, how fast can this specific spaceship go? And he said, it moves at the speed of plot. If it's necessary for it to get there in time to prevent a tragedy, then it does. If it's necessary that it be too slow to prevent a tragedy, then that's what happens. So basically, Creon, Creon got his like hag, hag ridden corpse ogram the night of, but he has, but he somehow has to wait for ages to hear from Tiresias, um, even though they both say the same thing. You know, Dircus has to make Amon swear to not move from this spot until he goes over to the court and then brings news back. Um, because otherwise Aemon would just go and and he'd free Antigone before she had the time to uh, before she had the time to use the method she's been alluding to. Um, anyway, potential spoilers, but like I'm I'm starting in a play that's been so forward paced, being the visible machine, seeing the visible machinery to slow it down, um, is taking me out of it a little bit. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, yes, yes, and no. I mean, it's it's it, it's not doing what the earlier plays are doing, which is that that the, the the because everything is much more Creon focused in the earlier plays. So it's this like this constant battering ram at Creon to change his mind, to change his mind, to change his mind, to change his mind. He doesn't change his mind until it is too, too late. Um, whereas here, because he's a little more fleeting. Uh, and things move around uh, and, and people are sort of popping in and out a lot more. Um, I, I, I also wonder if at pace, and this is saying a second look will, will, will give us a better idea of where, whether actually that's as apparent or an issue. Um, and and we, have, we have the close of the play to, to find out uh, how, how, those things, how those things wrap up. Uh, Eric. Uh, well, I think supposedly the reason he went to see Tyrese, or wants to see Tyrese, anyway, uh, is to get a different reading, which is kind of like going to like, you know, uh, um, like hoping that it's going to be positive or something. But also, uh, but what I was going to say was that it's interesting how he doesn't really give a reason for supporting the witches. <laughs> uh the hags he just sort of goes well i gave you all this space you can go and do your things now go experiment on them turn them into limpets or something um which is quite interesting considering like you know he's in power why would you leave someone in power who trusts people who won't like like is it like also because we had antigone at the beginning um talking to her father um who was going to go throw himself off a cliff and stuff um, if I remember correctly, uh, it, it it's like. But I, he, I think the hags are functioning yeah. more like a black ops division, isn't it? You know, the, the, this is the magical warfare division that you're not supposed to know about, and and, and you know, he's, 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 I don't think anyone else knows about them. I, I think they're yeah, supposed to be secret. But um, it's just an interesting point that they kind of like um, he has to fight Theseus, um, but then you've got sort of. Like if Amon is too obsessed with the Antigone, then he can't like perform in the field. But then if yeah, it's like sort of I don't know, tripping up over itself a bit, which is which is basically what Liza said. But also, it's interesting how it's doing it, which is quite I don't know. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah, it's 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 it is it is stirring more into the pot, and it is interesting because Tyresis gets a name check earlier, and yes, Creon is is, is interested in talking to him. But then Tyresis is sort of nobbled by the chorus, uh, and 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 sort of pushed forward. Um, so yeah, there's there's all sorts of interesting sort of ins and outs of what's going on here. Um, 
Anyway, we will find out how it all ends because I'm sure they all live happily ever after and uh, they have they ha have a picnic with Theseus when he arrives and uh, it, it mm. should be lovely. Um, um, is, is this the, the act where we have to change over? Or something? Yes. Uh, so basically, Liza, who do you want to be? Would you like to be Aemon or would you like to be Antigone for this, this, this close of, of play? Well, uh, you are this group. It's and, entirely um, up to you. It's a, I gave you both parts. You can't play both parts for this final scene. Who do you want to be? Uh, I'll, I'll be Antigone. Okay, I'll be Eamon. Uh, so, um, I, I've, I've called this Act 5, Scene 2. This is a point in the play where I'm really not... There, are, there, are, uh, there is an absence of scene breaks and, 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 and certain stage directions, some of which we've inferred. We may add some more as we go, as we decide things. But I've called this Act 5, Scene 2. Uh, uh, everybody else may have already exited, but they might be somewhere else on stage. I genuinely don't know what's going on yet. So enter Dirkus and Eamon. Dirkus is here. Yonder's the tomb, my lord, which thought it seemed too hard and solid for our strength to force. I know a place will open presently. Then let us break this wealthy cabinet and take from thence a jewel which the ransom of all the kings on earth would be a price too poor to purchase. Knewst thou, happy cave, or knew the world that what equal, true unequalled wealth thy bare unpolished bosom did contain, thou wouldst despise the richest temples reared on marble columns and high roofed with gold to thee. Would men with adoration come, as to a place more sacred than the cave that nourished Cretan Jove, the Bacchus Nysa, or the Atean Mount, from whence in flames the great Alcides mounted to the sky? But I forget myself. I first must know whether I live or no, for in that cave, not here, does Aemon breathe. Antigone? Who calls Antigone? Is it my Aemon? Dirkus, I live. Hadst thou that heavenly voice which has inspired a happier life into me than my creation did? Le let's lose no time in this sweet business. I'll open the tomb immediately, my lord. Sad Thebes, adieu. I'll find some happier country to convey my envied treasure to. Possessed of her, I shall be richer than the Theban crown can make me. Speak how fares my fairest love. Shall we be gone? I would, my dearest Aemon, be gone with thee rather than live. But fate, too cruel, fate prevents it. How? What fate can let our journey, if thy love, consent? I love thee, Aemon, better than my life, and never truly wished to live till now. But now... I cannot live. Oh, do not mock my joys, Antigone, or if thou dost not, tell me what sad disaster can befall. That sad disaster is befallen already. Fearing the pains that such a lingering death might bring upon me, I have ta'en already a gentle poison down, which long before against some such dire occasion I prepared. I feel it work. My vital spirits fail. My dearest love, farewell, live long and happy. Let fate hereafter recompense to thee what e'er her cruelty against me has wrought. No fate can make me happy. I am lost beyond her pet care. What end of tragedies can worth all Thebes for ever hope to see after this sorrow? Oh, I more than fear the prince's fury. Her white soul is fled. What unsubstantial bubbles are the best of human joys? How from the top of all my hopes and comforts in one fatal minute has envious fortune thrown me down again into the depth of misery and of woe. O oh, fortune, how extreme thou art in all thy favours and thy frowns. Most noble prince, collect that strength of man which of all the world expects from you, and arm yourself to bear with fitting patience this calamity. The passive fortitude is great and noble, as is the active. 
strike that sting no more. Do not in vain torment a desperate man with thy dull counsel, till it is as possible thou shouldst persuade a dead man to arise after his soul is fled as me to live. Now she is dead. I do conjure thee, Dirkus, with all the love thou bearest me by that faith which I have ever found and prized in thee to leave me here. My lord, I will obey. And thus I take my leave. Dirkus dies somehow. Too cruel, Dirkus. Was I not miserable enough before that but thou must load my sufferings with thy death? What cause hadst thou to die? Th thou hast not lost a love? Why should my loss extend so far as to the ruin of so brave a friend? Thy death has injured fair Antigone, and made a strange division in my grief. For all the sorrow which this breast could hold was due to her before, I must encroach upon her right in spending tears for thee. My breast too narrow for so great a grief, and must be quickly opened, thou pure soul of my Antigone, which still survives, though this fair palace be demolished quite by death's ungentle hand, thou heavenly substance, true object of a chaste and spotless love, thy Amon comes, and from these bonds of nature flies forth to meet thee in another world, to wed thee there, to finish there the rites of long cross love. And taste eternal sweets. Eamon dies. I'm going to pause there just before we get to the very, very fi final uh, moment. Um, so, uh, everybody's dead um, who's come on stage. Everybody's just uh, domino, domino suicides. Um, Antigone by poison. Uh, I thought she hanged herself, um, but uh, poison is good. Poison is fine. She did say she was going to. Um, uh, she had a way, so presumably she had a uh, a poison with with her. Um, I, I I was quite. I'm not quite sure why Dirkus kills himself. Frankly, um, I th I think it's a bit selfish um, at that moment. I I, th I, I it's it, it it does create an interesting reaction to Eamon. Uh Liza. Okay, so um, I thought in the earlier scene, especially where Eamon, uh where Eamon is wounded and Dirkus is taking care of him, I'm like, hmm, okay, this is um, this is a very nice bit of loyal affection between same gender characters, and you know, uh, that's something to take note of. And um, and in the end, having been ordered to leave, uh, if he stayed, he would be disobeying. If he left, it would be disloyal. So he dies to avoid to avoid doing either of those. And I think, you know, in the sort of canon of early modern emotional expression, that's very much, I think, an expression of devotion. Uh, so, you know, um, and, you know, a modern eye will put all sorts of uh, of readings into that kind of relationship. But what we can say, whatever, what. Uh, however it might be played, it's definitely affection. Mm. It's definitely love. Mm. Oh yes, yes, and and and, and to, to some degree reciprocated. You know, he's 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 going. You know, I, I, he's he's going to have to you know take a moment before he gets back to Antigone. Um, yes. It 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 it's as I say it's it's an interesting choice uh, at that moment. You know, you know maybe later. Yeah, it's it's it's. And it's also the fact that he sort of he dies, and we, we don't really know how they they're killing themselves. I assume they're just stabbing themselves or something. But um, you know, it, it's it's one of those 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 areas of detail here. Um, uh, okay, um, shall we finish the oh Eric, and then we'll finish the play because there isn't actually that much left. To do. I was going to say I think there's a similar thing in um, Sejanus where he kills himself for political reasons, um, like kills himself before the other person manages to kill him. Uh, which is maybe weird, um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Now, there's a problem going if he does survive that, he probably doesn't know what Creon would have in store for him. Um, assuming that you know, 
being there with A1 and not doing anything to stop him or to stop like you know, this situation occurring would be bad. So maybe killing himself is the only way out. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 from a sort of doyalist perspective, I suspect one of the reasons why this author has chosen this act to happen is he's just written a version of Cleopatra and he's thinking Eros and uh, and and Antony um, things. Uh, th th that's sort of, I think, where wh why this has happened. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll see see how that all sort of goes. Um, uh, are we all talking at the same time in a moment? <laughs> yes, Rob, I'm basically, I'm I am to Sophitus and then I'm Theseus. <laughs> yeah, well, to be fair, yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll pass, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, Liza's dead, so um, if, Liza, you could read a fetus, um, and you stay as the anthus, and I'll, I'll read, I will remain Eurydice still, so, um, yeah. Um, okay, uh, and then you can re reborn as Theseus in in the the non-existent scene break. Anyway, <laughs> everybody's dead. Uh, enter Ianthus, uh, Iphitus, um, uh, and Eurydice. Oh, horrid spectacle! See Iphitus, the prince Antigone, and Dorcas dead. All dead. I me. Look to the queen; she swoons. Alas, tis more than so. Cold death has seized her. I fear beyond recovery. Let's in and certify the king, who now may see the dire effects of his rash cruelty. And potentially everybody exits as we go into what we'll call Act 5, Scene 3. Enter Theseus and a chorus of Thebans. Our war's already ended. And the death of savage Creon, whose dire soul is fled to pacify the Argives' wandering ghosts, have satisfied our justice. Here we sheathe our sword again and free your town from fears. And now, in turn, with fitting obsequies, the carcasses of all your slaughtered foes. Let cruel Creon, too, though he at all deserve it not, have rites of funeral. Those pious rites will we perform with joy. And thanks to mighty Theseus, may the gods assist thee ever. And great Hercules, behold thy brave actions from the sky. Rejoice and not disdain at all to be esteemed thy equal by posterity. Send back our guy to her father's court with fair attendance. And it is left to you to place the Theban scepter where it is due. Thebes humbly bows to mighty Theseus and lays her crown and scepter at his feet. No, still let Thebes be governed by her own. It was not our war's intention to enthrall your land, but free it from a tyrant's yoke. And to preserve the conquered, not destroy them, we drew the sword of justice, not of conquest, ambitiously to spread our kingdom's bounds, but to avenge the laws of mad nature broke. This act being done, Theseus is peace again. Soldiers, march on to Athens. Thebes, adieu. Now let mankind enjoy a happy peace. Oh, let no monsters breed on earth to glut themselves with human slaughter. Let no thieves infest the woods. No tyrants stain the cities with blood, innocent, blood of innocence. But if such monsters must needs be bred to plague the wretched earth against nature and her holy laws to strive, let them appear while Theseus is alive. And they... Exit. Um, and yeah, play ends. Um, so a body count at the end's pretty good. Um, uh, Creon's dead. Uh, <laughs> didn't see that. Um, uh, he's gonna get a funeral though. So, you know, lucky him. Um, Eurydice's dead, dies of grief. I've just been out typing in the, the stage direction there. Uh, cold death has seized her. Um, I fear beyond recovery. So, okay, maybe, maybe, um, maybe that's, uh, that's premature, but probably, uh, is deaded. And, and then Theseus comes on and says, right, well, I've, 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 um, 
Rexus ex machina. Um, <laughs> a king, a king, a king turns up and tidies everything up. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, plotting and layout of scenes is less tidy towards the end of the play. I've still enjoyed it, but um, it, it, it after that really tight act three, which I adored, I, I really loved the scene that was set here. It's all become quite bitty. I, I thought Eamon's, you know, uh, final speech, uh, speeches and stuff worked really well and that sort of. But then this play really isn't interested in Creon. Um, it's really not that fussed about him. It, it's giving, it gives you the precy of Creon, but it's not giving you the whole stuff. Um, and that, that, that slight lack of focus there, because it's not like Creon gets a, a death scene. It's not like Creon, you know, it's just Theseus turns up and says he's dead. So there's, there's a certain flappiness around at the end here of, of, of the plot strands that are, are, are slightly um unsatisfactory but i've i have generally enjoyed the ride any thoughts on theseus's entrance at the end i mean I, i'm fine with it as a wrap-up i don't mind a king turning up and saying i've sorted everything out now you can now go home i'm, I'm not going to take over no i don't want the additional admin and responsibility uh that would be annoying uh eric well i was going to say that he's meant to be like half i think he's meant to be a demigod in this or not well not entirely a demigod but like he, he is kind of treated as a demigod like sort of like hercules was and that kind of thing um and i seem to remember he was a good friend of hercules in some other place that we've read um i, I think in one of the seneca tragedies featuring hercules uh, and theseus he, theseus tries to talk him off the edge basically uh, and uh, i think in that one he actually manages to and then hercules kills himself in a different way um <laughs> Theseus does turn up a, quite a lot as sort of a tidy up figure, actually. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the other Greek tragedies where he's basically his plot function is to turn up and sort something out or be um, you know, not always. He's not always a positive figure. Um, again, it's it's it, he, he functions wherever the plot wants him to go. Um, but that's that's um, that's the nature of mythology, really. Um, characters of characters switch depending i mean creon's quite a nice guy in the earlier theban plays and then he just becomes a total total asshole in in antigone um uh, which can either be massive character inconsistency or or narrative arc you know depending on your your, your point of view um so yeah uh, any other thoughts about the end uh, before we do final thoughts about the play overall no okay so well i've enjoyed the ride we've lost greg along the way um uh but uh he uh, uh generally seems to have uh it, it enjoyed this i've enjoyed this play I, I i am not unaware of its faults i mean we we there were some very strong opinions given about some of the choruses in the first half of the play um <laughs> where where the text sort of fails but it's sprightly in a way that i say we were very unimpressed with cleopatra um by thomas may um but this even even when it's less satisfactory it's still got a, a pace to it it's not very long it's it's got a nice sort of to it it's it's a bit extra i've i've generally enjoyed it i i i think some tweaks i mean eliza was talking about dumb show earlier about tidying up some of the dramaturgy in act three um but that's such a visual act and I wonder whether there's more visuals to add to this. We, we, we need more visuals. And of course, we've got a lot of bodies at the end. So there's body logistics. Creon needs a death scene, uh, even if that's just in dumb show. Um, and and more, more war as well. We can, have, we can add some more war in. I definitely think we can do that. Uh, Eric, any final thoughts? Well, I think you mentioned it earlier. I kind of want to do a run through of this to pace because I mean, okay, I remember the play as, as we read it because I remember the, the courses and stuff being quite draggy down uh, slash tedious. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like that scene, the like Act Three, basically, you could extract and just like build a whole audio play around it, like a soundscape as well. Just it's such a great like I don't know. Especially that scene with the with the you know where they're looking for bodies and they actually meet in the dark and stuff and yeah 
I don't know. It's just something something really magical happened there. Then he kind of well, no, he didn't lose it, but I mean, plot had to move on, kind of thing. And maybe he rushed the ending. And then... hmm. I'm liking it. Yeah. No. It, 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 I mean, it's it's it, it, it's even more so than so. Uh... Pelopidorum Secunda, uh, which you know was all over the place in a much more expansive way. Uh, this is at least a tighter script, even if it doesn't uh, quite land or, or all its blows. Uh, Tom, any final thoughts? Yeah, very much enjoyed it. I, as I say, I, I'm even now just reading Eamon's, um scene. The lines are the writing is is each line has uh can land and it's it flows quite beautifully i mean as i say i'm just reading amon's um speech word uh Dirkus kills himself mm. uh and i think that was the, that was the the pleasure all the way through the all the way through the play was um the writing was was very good very it, it had a particular flow and rhythm to it that I really enjoyed. Yeah, it's really playable. I really enjoyed doing that speech. I, I lucked out when, uh, 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 when uh, Liza chose 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 Antigone. Um, it was um, it, it's very playable. I think this is the thing. All of this is playable. Um, uh, so so whatever sort of technical faults and some of you know the the, the plotting faults that, that, that are there. You can do something with this. I mean, the hags were great fun, um, random as they were. I mean, they, they have a certain unity, but um, you know, they really perk up what the, you know the middle of the play in a way that is, you know, it really has a lovely pivot in that sense. That you know, there's there's no interval for my production of this. It's just going to be seventy five minutes, bash straight through. Because um, uh, uh, I think you could do it about for that way. I think, uh, Liza, any final thoughts? Just that, in general, yeah, I like how this play, I like how the play is paced. I like how it goes along. It's, it's, it doesn't indulge. Sometimes, like I said earlier, sometimes it feels that the pacing means you miss essential things. And certainly, you know, directing wise, the director would have to be very aware of the story beats that occur and are simply reported. Mm. Um, they would have to make sure that those story beats come across somehow. Uh, even in the characters uh, uh, relating of them. Um, and the hags, like the hags are just, um, yeah, They it feels like they're sort of zooming in on motorcycles having come from another play. And, and they're like, yes doing our hag thing and then they get back on the motorcycles. <laughs> um, so obviously when I direct it for the globe, that's what's gonna happen. Um, period accurate motorcycles, uh, probably hand cranked or something. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I like the play. I like that it makes Antigone less isolated. It gives her, for about two seconds, it gives her a best friend, but that moment is crucial. Mm. Um, it also, gives Eamon, it gives her Eamon as a lover, but it gives Eamon his best friend as well. So he's not isolated and he doesn't exist solely to be Antigone's lover, um, that he that Eamon has his own story. So yeah, in, in general, this is kind of stage worthy even in some ways. Uh, we don't of... use that word here. They're all okay, but stage. it seems like it's more stageable than some versions of classical tragedies that we have read. Hmm. Uh, it's 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 certainly designed for the stage in a way that, say, the Seneca uh, translations aren't. Um, hmm. You know, they they are much more formally uh, formal exercises. Um, Eric, uh, I was just going to say because you started talking about the hags, and I remembered something I wanted to say earlier. Um, the I, I like how they actually have personalities; they don't have this thing of like, um, you know, there are three of them being like in a, uh, just like hag one, hag two, hag three, um, because they, they disagree with each other as well. Mm. Like they're kind of, 
and you can see them thinking for a moment. Shall, shall we? Shall we continue here? Shall we go there? Shall we go yeah, to it's, the it's, cave? It's, it's, my one, my <laughs> one goes. Well, we've got this magic cave. It's great for doing uh, the, the evil ceremonies in. And he's going. Yeah. We could just do it here. We could just do it here. We don't need to go to the cave. You know, should we just do it here? There's, we'd, we'd have to drag the body. It would take ages. I love that. I, I I just had a vision of the hags as like 1950s cooking show hostesses in in like polka dotted dre dresses or so, something going. I just have the loveliest fresh corpse. Well, what do you have, Eugenia? Oh, <laughs> I just got some nice dead people's ingredients from the field. And like for first hag, I mean, they they appear because Creon has left the corpses unburied for them to use. Um, and and the first hag, so you'd expect them to, to appear and go, mwah, corpses. But no, the first hag appears and she's like, these corpses are crap. They're not fresh. We mm. can't, you know, you, you couldn't refrigerate them, Creon. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I, I, I see them coming on with wheelie trolleys. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and... and... You know, a system, Tupperware, lots of Tupperware. Uh, anyway, uh, we really must go. Um, we have had fun. Uh, we hope to return to this uh, soonish. Uh, actually, it's very plausible that we will. Uh, all that remains to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful readers. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Cold death has seized her.